Good afternoon, and I'm glad to see that State Line is a place of a lot of faith in this COVID environment. But don't let faith have a collision with presumption. Be a people of wisdom still. Bring me up a little, my brother. I don't want to be burned out before the message is over. I want to thank Pastor Ulatunji. You know, those are not names you call every day for his passion and for his invitation. He is a man that I really admire. On our way down here, we saw some Sunday law signs. And I said, wow, there are still people that believe that the Sunday law is possible. Well, if you don't believe it's possible, you cannot afford to miss this afternoon. For more than 40 years, I have taken up the particular task of tracking and, and gathering articles and information specifically about those who are orchestrating this Sunday movement. Because so many times when we talk about Sunday law, we talk about what Adventists are saying. And people may have room to doubt it because it comes from us. But if I show you a horse, you can't doubt it's a horse. So the phrase does fit. What I'm going to show you this afternoon comes from the horse's mouth. From those that have been working on it for a long time. And so often we overlook what's happening around us because of what God has blessed us with. I praise the Lord for the inspiration we receive through Ellen White. What do you say? But she just received that counsel to calibrate our eyes. As you know, when you're growing up and you play the game Red Car, anybody know what I'm talking about? When the kids are in the back seat, they don't know what to do. One says to the other, well, let's count all the red cars. And all of a sudden, all the cars look red. <laughs> you can't unsee the red cars. The Lord has given us the Bible and the spirit of prophecy to help us find the red cars. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. I want to encourage you to come back this afternoon. I also want to thank the pastor and his wife for encouraging us to come he said, we are people of faith. We know that we are still in a COVID environment. And I don't want to minimize that because some people have different views about it. It's unfortunate that in America, COVID is a political issue, not a health issue. But around the world, it's a health issue. It has been weaponized in America for political expediency. And some people have succumbed to that. And I'm going to pray for those people. But I know family members, I know people that have died from it, young and old, every age, every age in between. So we don't minimize it. And even those who practice the safest health practices can, can succumb to the environment of this age. That's why in Revelation 21, verse 4, the, the Lord says, there will be no more death, sorrow, crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things. Until the former things have passed away, we are all susceptible to something. That's why we have to make sure that we do what we do, what we must do, and then God will do what he promises to do. But don't allow presumption and faith to live in the same bucket. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Also, I'm excited to be down here with my wife. Honey, would you please stand, my sweet wife? We are going on. Come on, honey, just turn around. Let him see why I'm still happy. <laughs> yes, we've been through a lot together. We will we'll be celebrating 38 years in May of this year. Now, if you pray like we did, you'll look like us after 38 <laughs> years. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But God has preserved us. We've traveled around. I look at pictures of my wife, and we've traveled around, and People have taken pictures of her when we were in Australia or this country or that country, and they look back and they say, you haven't changed in 15 years. Now I have. My hair has turned gray because I, I laid down the bottle called Just for Men. 
I, de I, I decided it's time to look smarter than the young people. <laughs> Some of you young folk, you know, they got jet black hair and they think they know it all. But uh, when you get some gray hair, you know more than they do. Come on, amen, old people. And <laughs> so I don't worry about just for men. I used to look, you know, I used to admire just waking up and when I see a tinge of gray, I said, just for men. <laughs> but the Lord says wisdom and age ought to have something in common. And so I praise the Lord. That's why it's important, men, to fall in love with things that don't change. Because she might look like all that, but something's going to change. And as we are changing, my wife and I going through the seasons of change, we have a connection that's far deeper, far deeper than the surface. But I did say that, and I don't want to keep harping on this, but I want to make it very clear. If the Lord can cause us to look this good down here, Imagine what it's going to be like in heaven. So I'm holding on, and she's holding on. She keeps telling me to, you know, build muscles. I said, hold on, honey. <laughs> hold on. You know, there are going to be golden streets, and there will be a gold gym in heaven. <laughs> hold on, it's coming. I'm not worried about that right now. If I could wake, if I could wake up tomorrow morning, I'm blessed. And it's so good to be down here with you. So, so on, after saying all that, we're not going to be too huggy-huggy and kissy-kissy and happy Sabbath and all that. We're going to say happy Sabbath. And I hope that will be sufficient. Also, my good friend, we grew up together. Some of you may call him Ricky, but I, some of you may call him Cedric. But uh, he's like a brother to me. We grew up, we met as teenagers in Bethel in New York City. And we grew up together in the same house. He knows a lot about me. I know a lot about him. But we do say that he was determined to be in the Marr family some way or another. My wife and I introduced him to her cousin. And I like them to stand up together. Melba Walker and Ricky Walker, why don't you stand up together? And they've been married now more than 30 years. Amen. Amen. And they've done a good job. They have two daughters, two very wonderful professionals. Uh, but just pray for our young people because you could have a degree and not have Jesus. A lot of our young people are well-educated. I've often said an intellectual mind without Christ is a dangerous mind. Pray for them to be intellectually stimulated but heaven-bound. And uh, also, we have, a, we have feisty family members. If you're West Indian, you know what I mean, feisty. If you're American, just say spicy. <laughs> that are always ready. Come on, Jackie, stand up. This is uh, Melba's sister, Jacint, and uh, she's, the, she's the spicy family member. You know, you can wake her up at 2.30 in the morning, she's ready. And we all need those characteristics to keep the family excited. Good to see marvelous Marva. Marvella, marvelous Marvella, and uh, and I want to just thank you, but um, also bring greetings on behalf of 3ABN, where many of you see us. But I also am a pastor in the Illinois Conference. I've been in the ministry now for 34 years as an ordained minister, but I work where 3ABN is located. But I got ordained in '95, began ministry in '87, California, Ohio, Missouri Conference, now the Illinois Conference. And uh, Pastor Doug Batchelor and I began in ministry together. Uh, I was his evangelist and uh, Bible worker, singing evangelist, and youth pastor. And then the Lord transitioned us to where we are today. And he and I talk periodically. And we, every now and then, we go over our journey and we say, look at where the Lord brought us from. Hitherto has God led us. And so thank you for inviting us to front line this morning. State line. <laughs> can, I say, can I say state line is on the front line? Okay, I think I, okay, I'll say it that way. State line is on the front line. Huh? Here, give me the news. Breaking news, state line is on the front line. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and this morning, the message is entitled, Two Words That Are Most Potent and Most Powerful, The Remnant. 
Let us pray. Gracious Father, loving Lord, we are living in a trying hour, an hour where the world is being challenged. We're living in the hour where the church is being challenged, where the people of God are being tested, where the church is being sifted and shaken. And you told us, he that endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And so, precious Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit to come this morning and continue with us. We have been blessed so much already through the quotations and the encouragement from the pastor and the various leaders in this church. We can almost say the benediction and go home filled. But Father, you've sent us here for the purpose of uplifting your holy name, for giving you the glory, and for proclaiming what you have put on our hearts. Lord, may I do so humbly, may I do so responsibly. Consider your people, Lord, and speak through me to those for whom you know they need a special message. But I desire to do nothing but give you the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The Lord put on my heart not too many years ago, a couple of years ago, the need to get the gospel out. And I praise the Lord for your evangelistic pastor. We need men that are fired up. I've often said either you are on fire for the Lord or you'll be on fire by the Lord. <laughs> I'm glad that your pastor is on fire for the Lord. So he doesn't have to be on fire by the Lord. You know, I've often said there are two seats at the end of this journey. Smoking and non-smoking. And I plan on being... <laughs> I plan on being in the non-smoking section. <laughs> non-smoking section. <laughs> but the Lord, lights, the Lord lights fires in us, and we want those fires to burn. Do you know very well that Three Angels' messages is our message. Not T.D. Jake's message. Not Joel Osteen. Not Joyce Meyer. Not any of those others. They have their gifts and skills for which they must give an account. But God has given us a message unlike any other message. Not just to proclaim, but to live. So we are not boasting that we have the truth. The truth is too big for us to have it. The truth has us. We don't want to make that mistake. But a few years ago, the Lord impressed me to write a booklet called The Three Angels' Messages in Summary. It's 46 pages but it's like one of those pills you get from your doctor and he says, don't make a mistake and take two of them. It's concentrated. It is Bible only. Not that I do not believe in Ellen White. I quote her quite frequently. But the world needs to find the truth of God's word first before we put before them a test that they are not even prepared for. It outlines in clear, unmistakable tones all three messages. Helps you understand about the judgment hour. What does it mean? Who is the redeemer? What does it mean, angels flying in the midst of heaven? It's broken down very, very clearly. And thus far, we have moved about 400,000 already. And 3ABN just ordered 200,000 more. If you want an evangelistic tool that's designed for this generation, you need to get this and get it out to your community. As Pastor talked about evangelism, get this message out. Uh, fairly soon is also going to be on Kindle download. And we've just been encouraged to translate it into Spanish. A copy of it was sent down to the university in Cuba, the Adventist University of Cuba. And they read it and they said, we want this in Spanish. And they translated it. So we are trying to get it in as many languages as we can because this is a message that will be relevant until Jesus returns. And we've got to get people ready for the coming of the Lord. A message that is very much a part of the everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel. And Jesus said of that, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. So let's just trust the Lord and do what he has called us to do. I'm looking forward to the day when we can relax in the kingdom. But until then we can't relax. And I must say this, when I walked in this morning, the first gentleman I met was um, uh, 
Brother Gunn, he, he's one of the guys in the sound booth. And um, I said, what's your name? He said, uh, Brother Gunn. I said, so there's a gun in the church. <laughs> and uh, I, was, I was being lighthearted about it until he told me his wife's name. His wife's name is I own a gun. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, I said, I said, <laughs> I own a gun. So I said, man, we have a safe church up in here. We are surrounded. We are surrounded. I own a gun. But I thank the Lord for people that are on fire for the Lord. And thank you, Brother Richard, for helping me out so much. And Brother Abraham, who's back there making sure that things go well. We praise God. It's good to be able to be joyful in the Lord, but to be serious when it comes to God's Word. And um, go with me now as we open God's Word. I know the scripture reading came forth. Since there was music right before the sermon, I'm going to sing at the end of the sermon. I'm not going to try to preempt what was just laid before us. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17, so wonderfully read this morning. And if you don't know it, you can be a Seventh-day Adventist. I'm just going to quote it. And I'm going to quote it from the translation that I grew up with. And um, because it's so clear. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. I want to make an announcement. Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. If you haven't learned anything in 2020, then you must have just been born. Because 2020 is not a year that we want to repeat. And I'm going to talk about a few things through the sermon, so I'm going to ask the Lord to, to give me the wisdom to wait till I get to it. Because there's so many things to talk about. Sometimes we could just put all the food on the table in the beginning and leave the dessert for later. But we have to be clear about where we are as the people of God. 1986, my wife and I were driving home from California to Florida. We were coming back from being with the Heritage Singers for two years. I sang with them for two years. My wife worked as their on-the-road bookkeeper, and it was 3,016 miles. We were driving a 1976 Toyota Corona station wagon. We were traveling in the summer. And that, we were traveling along Route 10. That's the southern route. That's the hot route. The desert roads were long. The car had no air conditioning. The temperature was unbearable. The only way to get air is to open the window and drive fast. The headlights failed. The mountains were steep. The car overheated a number of times. My wife announced to me about halfway, she says, I'm tired of driving, which left it up to me to drive the west of the way, and I was exhausted. But I want to say, when we saw the sign flow, saying, welcome to Florida, all that tiredness vanished away. My wife sat up. We started seeing signs that were familiar to us. We knew that we were nearing home. And we sat up. The weary journey behind us all came together. We hung in there. We endured to the end. We were no longer tired. We knew that what we started four days ago finally came to an end. You see, brothers and sisters, I'm telling you this morning, as the remnant, we've got to hang in there. The songwriter says, we know not the hour of the master's appearing, yet signs all foretell the moment is nearing when he shall return to the promised most cheering, but we know not the hour. I can't stop yet. He will come. 
Let us watch and be ready. He will come. Somebody say it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He will come in the clouds of his Father's bright glory, but we know not the hour. This hour calls for patience. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And so we've been through a lot together. You can't get to 38 years without having differences of opinion. I need some help from the old people. <laughs> you know, I'm always amazed. Young folk that get married, say, how long have you been married? Three years. <laughs> say, we love each other. I said, uh, hang on in there. <laughs> Tell me the same thing in five more years. And then some, and some folk hit that intersection, and they start getting upset and want to trade in for that, mo that model for a new model. Like the guy that was married for 50 years and he traded his wife in for two 25-year-olds. You'll get that on Monday. <laughs> Brethren, we've got to hang in there. We've got to love our wives. And I've said, as a, I've said as a husband who've grown through a lot of things, Brethren, if you love your wife like you love your car, maybe I shouldn't finish that statement. She'll take you places where your car will never take you. And I'm in the Lord. I want to make it very clear. We have been to more than 60 countries together. When that plane lands and I'm done talking with the crowd, I'm talking to my wife. When I'm exhausted, my wife is right with me. When difficulty comes, she's right there. When we're going through hardship together, she's right there. When she's going through hardship, I'm right there. And that's why this morning... I have this thermos. We have a tradition in our family. Every Sabbath morning, I have ginger tea. Thank you, Flo and Angie, for making that this morning. But we've got to hang in there. We're living in the closing hours of Earth's history. That's why when I thought about the message, I asked the question, what about the remnant makes the devil so angry? What is there about the remnant that makes the devil so angry? The reality is the day is coming. And this is why I'm hanging in there. The day is coming when heaven is going to introduce God's eternal allies. God's not looking for just a church. God is looking for those committed to the mission of heaven. When that day comes, polarity will be complete. Polarization will be finalized. Everybody is going to be in one group or the other. And I'm hanging on. As Pastor said, and I love that, Pastor was very clear about the fact that we should not have splinter groups. I was raised in New York City where the Shepherd's Rod did their work. We've got so many groups nowadays, people believe in the Spirit, they don't believe in the Spirit, they believe Jesus was created, and then some people say he wasn't created. They believe that there is no third person in the Godhead, so they fight against it. And I told somebody once who sent me a letter that said, now, I believed everything you said, Pastor Loma King, until you said the Holy Spirit revealed to me and then he said, now nah, stop listening to you. And I said, you sound just like the Pharisees in the days of Stephen. When Stephen said, you resist the Holy Spirit just like your fathers did. I said, so if you have the problem of the Holy Spirit, don't make your problem my problem. Because the Bible says, grieve not the Holy Spirit whereby you are sealed. So if you want to shut off your lifeline, that's up to you. But don't mess with my lifeline. So we can't be caught up in all these side issues. The Adventist church is going through so many distracting issues. Pastor, some of the people are warming up. You could cool them down a little bit if you like. Because I was cold a moment ago, but now people are getting hot. So you could turn the heat back down and the temperature back up or whatever you want to do. But there's so many distracting issues nowadays. There's so many things that are pulling our attention away from our call, our message for the hour. We've got to be clear that we know what the gospel is and do not get off on side issues. I have people that I think were clear-minded until I receive emails from them and letters from them. And sometimes all it takes is from somebody to be very highly educated. They might say, well, this person's been Adventist 40 years. Well, Uzziah reigned for 52 years and became a fool at the end of his life. So it's not how long you've been around, but how wise you get when you get older. So age means absolutely nothing. The devil doesn't wait the devil waits until you think you're there. That's why the Bible says in James, let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. So don't even cite experience as the reason why I should accept your word above God's word. 
And then some folks say, well, Ellen White shouldn't be listened to. She didn't have an education. Somebody once called me and said, uh, she doesn't understand Greek and doesn't understand Hebrew. I said, she doesn't have to. God does. But when that day comes, there'll be no distinction better than the distinction that we are on God's side and not on the side of frail men. Jesus said in Matthew 12 and verse 30, He that is not with me is against me. In these last days, the remnant church must be with Jesus. Let me say that again. Not with books, but with Jesus. We have a lot of books. But if your salvation is in a book, you're in trouble. Your salvation has to be in Christ because in the final contest between light and darkness, good and evil, Christ and Satan, truth and error, there is no middle ground. We've got to know what we believe and we cannot wait till the controversies arise to know it. I sat down once on a Sabbath afternoon with, I was just in my third church, I was still a young man, I still had black hair at the time and it was not motivated by just for men, it was real. And a couple pulled me aside one day, they had a whole stack of paper, and they put together, they said to me, Pastor, we want to talk to you about some things we found in the writings of Ellen White that are just not consistent. And they said, we don't want to try to shake your faith, we just want to share this with you. The devil knows exactly how to lie. You know, we don't want to shake your faith, but we want to share this with you. But I encouraged them at the very beginning. I said, let me just let you know from the very beginning. And I was a young man. I said, I want you to know that no matter what you share with me, it's not going to shake my faith. So they went ahead and shared. And they said, well, the Bible said God cursed the, the fig tree. But Ellen Wise said he cursed the sycamore tree. Which one was right? I said, they both were right. I said, because if you study history and if you study geography, in that region of the world, in the Greek word, it was the ficus sycamorus. It was merged together. They merged the tree. They grafted the sycamore and the fig tree together. So she was right. They had no answer. I said, what about Ellen White? She said that we shouldn't buy bicycles. I said, if you read the context of it, there was a man who got so enamored by bicycles that he ignored the needs of his family. She was speaking to him directly. All right, all right. Well, well what about when Ellen White struggled with the health message? I said, well, we all struggle with something. What are you struggling with? So we've got to keep our minds clear. Don't let somebody's hobby horse become the vehicle we ride on. Because the devil is angry and he'll come to you. Ellen White says Satan's footsteps are noiseless. She also says that when you realize he is using you, he's already done. So we've got to be sober. We've got to be vigilant. Because our adversary, the devil, is walking around like a warring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's not playing and neither should we. When it comes to holy things, we ought to be holy. When you want to let your hair down and have fun, don't mix God with frivolity. Understand he is God. He ain't my boy. He ain't my homie. I had to pull a young man one, once that had done a presentation before a group of young people. He said, you know, Jesus is my homie. When he came up to say, no, he ain't your homie, he's your savior. Don't bring God down to the commonality of humanity. He should, when the angels speak his name, they bow before him. They veil their faces with their wings. Never should we mix the holy with the unholy. We must always maintain a difference because there is a day coming that everybody is going to kneel. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So the question I ask you today is where are you going to kneel? That's what we have to determine today because the only pressing question is where are we going to kneel? So now that I gave you the introduction, come with me to the sermon. Come with me to the last act in the 6,000-year controversy of the ages. Come with me to the presentation of the fellowship of the unashamed. Come with me to the introduction of those that have made up their minds to stand on uncompromising truth. They are the remnant. Revelation introduces a movement that has been in development for more than 6,000 years. But to understand them more fully, we have to understand who they are, what they believe, where they can be found, when they were born, why do they exist, and why did it take so long for the devil to get angry? 
because it didn't say he was angry in Genesis. It said he was subtle. But he's angry now. When you study the Bible, you find the devil and the woman in the Garden of Eden. You find the devil and the woman in the book of Revelation. But his attitude has changed. He was able to deceive the woman in the garden, but I thank the Lord when he came back to her again 6,000 years later, she said, I got a different man now. <laughs> I'm not giving you up. I'm not giving him up for you. So he's angry. And Revelation reveals that the remnant is to stand firm in the unfolding events of the last days. So let's walk through six points about the remnant today. Six points. The first one is the remnant stay focused amidst distractions. The remnant stays focused amidst distractions. You see, friends, the remnant, let's define the remnant. Who is the remnant? In a nutshell, those divinely commissioned to proclaim to the world God's final message prior to the close of probation and the return of Jesus. Commissioned to proclaim the last message to the world. Now, I'm going to tell you later on in the sermon what that means because sometimes we could think that because we keep the Sabbath that we are proclaiming the message. Sometimes we think because we're second or third generation Adventists that we automatically qualify. A number of years ago, I heard a preacher, an Adventist preacher, say, if you were born on the front pew of the church, you still need to be born again. So let's not get remnant mixed up. The Bible qualifies what the remnant is all about. You see, the remnant are convinced that through the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, the time will come that the last message is to be given to the world. But they stand on a foundation not built by politics, but built by Jesus. The remnant are not politically sidetracked. I'm going to say that again. I'm going to say that again. Because I heard two terms that don't make sense, that are thrown around in the Adventist church. And I looked through the Bible, I couldn't find it. I looked through the writings of Ellen White. I couldn't find it. We have this term in our church nowadays, conservative and liberal. You need to give liberal offerings. <laughs> That's the only place it applies. Liberal offerings and be conservative when it comes to the world. Amen, somebody. But we have been molded by politics and the devil has taken his time to mold us. I mean, you all know, I'm, I'm trying my best to avoid talking about the last four years, but I mean, we can't ignore it. We all lived it. But let me make something very clear. Although we saw the diabolical growth of the ignominious position of political quagmire over the last four years, let's not just, let's not just think it started there. The devil works gradually. He works up, and we think that somehow this next guy or the next guy or maybe the next woman is going to be the answer to the ills of the world. The only answer to the ills of the world is Jesus. But in the last four years, the devil has done a job on the Adventist church. And I, as a pastor, I've spoken to my church on, and I appreciate you, pastor, so much. I like the fact that when he sees something, he calls it out. I told my church a number of months ago, I said, I'm not your pastor alone. I'm a watchman. And I got to see, if I see the sword coming, I'm going to blow the trumpet. Because I'm not going to stand before God and answer for your blood. I'm going to answer for my own. And so when we see the things entering the church that can split the church and divide the church, when members at fellowship lunch are talking more about the president than about Jesus, something's wrong. When we can't even agree... We're trying to uh, accomplish a mission, but one of us are on the left, the other one is on the right, and I put that into context. One day the Lord showed me uh, how to put that into context because there are some people in my church and some people in other, other churches and some maybe even be here that say, well, the left is messing up the world, and other people might say, well, the right is messing up the world. And Jesus said to me, don't worry about the left and right. Keep your eyes on the man in the middle. Because if you remember the scene of the cross, at the, at the cross, there was a criminal on the left and a criminal on the right. So if you're on the left or you're on the right, you're a criminal. <laughs> hey, amen. I don't care what side you're on, you, you're a criminal. You better be a wise criminal to call on Jesus in your closing hours. Amen. 
one of those criminals said, we need Jesus. Now, I'm not going to say which one it was, but you better be that criminal or else you're going to end on the cross, go on the grave, and come out in the wrong resurrection. So I do not waste time exalting humanity because I am, fr I'm, first of all, Lord, help me today. What hit the world by storm didn't hit my wife and I by storm. We are from New York. What the world saw, we saw 40 years ago. And unfortunately, we got to pray for the Adventist church to be extricated from political constipation. I had to say it that way. Because some of us are so full of politics that when we try to talk about Jesus, the other person guides it right back to politics. Some people, some people use words that are, that are born in the environment of politics. So brethren, please, divorce yourself from the White House and keep your eyes on the right house. Because last I checked, nobody has stood up as a candidate to try to vote Jesus out. The only one that did it knows he has a short time. So that's a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Let's keep our minds on that. And when the church is united in mission, politics would not turn us away from one another. The devil tried to find a way to divide us as a people. So he sent politics amongst us. And then some people say, well, you know, I like policies because, you know, the financial expediency, low taxes. Brethren, if that's what you want to do, that's up to you. But if you put aside scriptural principles for financial reasons, you're getting ready for the mark of the beast. Because there are going to be those who want to sustain their financial platform. They won't be able to buy or sell unless they compromise. So the devil's testing the waters now so he gives you low taxes. If you vote for me, I'll give you low taxes. And some people say, well, that's why I voted for him, for low taxes. I want to tell you, when money no longer has any value, the Lord will supply all your need. Ask Elijah. So we have to keep our minds. Today, we must keep our minds set on Christ. And here's the reason why. Ellen White made it clear in Councils for the Church. She said, Satan hopes, page 344, Satan hopes to involve the remnant people of God in the general ruin that is coming upon the earth. As the coming of Christ draws near, he will be more determined. What two words did I just say? More determined and decisive in his efforts to overthrow them. That's why Jesus said it in John 18, verse 36. My kingdom is not of this world. Now, what does that mean about, as a citizen of America? We should be involved in the process of making decisions about our future. But don't allow the process to get in place of the proclamation. Don't allow the missions that change every four or eight years to eclipse the mission that has never changed. Because when, when the next guy is gone, then somebody would change their mind about the next person. But I'm praying that the Lord will come before the next person does. <laughs> you know, when you have more time behind you than you have ahead of you, your prayer life changes, am I right? You know, these 15-year-olds, these they just pray frivolously, but when you have more time behind you than you have in front of you, like I heard uh, my good friend John Bradshaw last night on 3AB, and he said, he said, the world can offer you 85 years or 75 years or even 90 years. Why would you settle for that when you can have eternity? <laughs> Let's not become distracted. Because the same tactics that Satan used to distract the people of God in the Old Testament, he's using to distract the people of God today. Go to Nehemiah chapter 1 with me this morning. The people of God must remain focused amidst distractions. He's using the same tactics today. And he's seeking to gain access to the heart and mind of those claiming to be a part of the remnant. Look at Nehemiah chapter 1, and I'm reading verse 3. And by the way, this was the building, uh, rebuilding of the walls. It's amazing that as a people, pastor, that we have to rebuild the walls. Look what it says here. Verse 3. And they said unto me, Nehemiah 1 and verse 3, 
And I'm reading from the King James on this passage because it uses the word remnant. The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in what? Great affliction and reproach. That is what Satan wants to do to the Seventh-day Adventist church. Leave us in great affliction and reproach. He wants the world to look at Adventists and say, look at them. They claim to be, but look at how they live. They claim to be, but look at how they talk. They claim to be, but look at the way they live. Look at their lifestyle. Look at the way they treat one another. But look what he does. It continues by saying, the wall of Jerusalem also is what? Broken. Broken down and the gates are burned with fire. What the devil did to Israel then, he's seeking to do to the church again today. He's seeking to break down our walls. What are our walls? The word of God is the first wall. It is the line of distinction that when we stand firm on God's word, nothing can shake our minds. Brethren, let me encourage you. We don't know how much time we have left before Jesus comes, do we? What other reason can I give you other than that, that you should be in God's word every day? How often did I say? Every day. My wife and I are now reading the Bible together through the second time. Reading it through together the second time, and we are in the book of Isaiah. You want to strengthen your marriage? Read the Bible together. You want to have a strong home? Bring your children to the Bible circle and read the Bible together. Because so many of them are captured by their devices. And I, I would say as a person who's a techie, and I like gadgets, but your gadgets should never be smarter than you are. They call them smartphones. <laughs> smartphones for a dumb generation. Smartphones are so smart that sometimes people could be in danger and don't even know it. I looked at a news uh, broadcast once. It happened on the train in Oakland, California. A man walked on the train brandishing a gun. And he announced, this is a holdup. Nobody heard him. <laughs> he yelled again, this is a holdup. Somebody went. He got off the next stop. <laughs> Not even a gun could get their attention away from their devices. <laughs> it was a failed holdup. Because while he's trying to steal from them, the phone has already stolen their minds. And the phones are getting smarter and faster. 3G, 4G. I remember, uh, come on, I'm going to help me out. My dad. I remember back when we had to connect to the internet. And you had that sound like, you remember when you connected years ago? <laughs> you know, and you have to pay to get on the internet. And you, and you go to a hotel and you have to dial a certain number to get your email. And it would like take five minutes for one email to download. And you say, man, it's fast. <laughs> you know, Ricky and I, we were raised in a generation where if you wanted news, you had to get a newspaper. And you had to go to magazine racks to buy magazines. Nowadays, young folk don't know how to read. They don't study. They just look for the answers. You know, you know what's the theory of relativity? Let me Google it. No, study to show thyself approved. There's a point to the story. We have become so incarcerated by things happening fast that we fail to realize that the Word of God is a slow-cooked meal. You've got to taste and see that the Lord is good. It's a 12-course meal. Come on, say amen out here. And until you have the Bible, not necessarily digital, but if you get a book in your hand, it takes on a greater relativity and a greater meaning because you don't have... Just think about it this way. If you go to battle and you pull out a digital sword, you... <laughs> You, you show your enemy, see my gun, it's on my phone. <laughs> He's going to shoot you and leave you right on the spot. You got you to understand how to use God's word. Amen, somebody. You got to know where it's found. It's too late for Adventists to be saying, I know it's in the Bible somewhere. You're going to fall. 
When the test comes to you, that's why, and I'm praising you. I'm, I'm not giving you too many accolades, but I'm just appreciating the fact that your pastor is awake. We have, we have in our church, we have declared this year to be the year of doctrinal integrity at our church. And I'm training every one of my members. We're doing a Bible marking plan. We are equipping every member of our church to be an evangelist. Praise the Lord for that. We're beginning next Sabbath afternoon Bible marking plan. We're putting together lessons so that if you've never given a Bible study before, you can put it in your Bible and walk through intelligently what that particular topic is all about. We're teaching our young people about digital evangelism, how to be an evangelist in a world where the internet never went down because of COVID. COVID didn't affect the internet. So we're teaching them how to be digital evangelists, how to put something sensible on Instagram and YouTube and Facebook and TikTok and whatever else. It's funny, the people on TikTok don't even know time is winding down. So let me transition to my second point so that I don't talk for two hours. We must do... We must do our part to preserve the walls of the church. Now, let me make it clear. We don't build walls to keep folk out. We build walls to keep the devil out. I'm going to take my time to qualify that on my next two points. We don't build walls to keep people out. We build walls to keep the devil out. And I'll wait till I get to my fifth point to qualify that. The remnant also, point number two, the remnant preserve allegiance to heaven's government. Now you might think this is also a part of the first point. It's not. Look at Matthew chapter 22 and verse 21. Look what the Lord says. Matthew chapter 22 and verse 21. Jesus established a striking illustration between religion and politics. And I'm going to read a quotation to you in just a moment that is amazing. Because we use the phrase present truth, do we not? Matthew 22, verse 21, the Lord said to the disciples, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are what? Caesar's. And to God the things that are what? That are God. So Caesar has a podium and Jesus has a podium. Don't merge the two together. But listen to this quotation. This is from letter, chapter, letter 4, 1898, paragraph 7. Paragraph 17. I want you to listen intently. Just as soon as those who claim to believe present truth feel at liberty because of the example given them by ministers and men who are supposed to be stewards of sacred truths, begin to mingle with the world and take part in its politics, they have weakened, they have awakened a spirit of strife and a burning enthusiasm that quenches the spirit of God in the human heart and opens the door wide for the enemy of all righteousness to take possession. Let me say that again another way. Those of us who believe present truth. What is present truth? Truth for this time. Like the three angels' messages, truth for this time. But it should not cause us to become a people that just hold on to the title rather than allowing the reality of the message to transform our lives. But here's where the problem has come in. Some ministers have given their members permission to stray off of the path of integrity, to stray off the path of doctrinal integrity. Some ministers in their pulpits have become voices for politics rather than voices for Jesus. There was a gentleman who walked in our church about a month ago. His name is Charles. We live in a community that's predominantly Caucasian. God has a sense of humor because a little less than 20 miles from where I'm pastoring was the headquarters of the Ku Klux Klan not too long ago. And uh, I'm pastoring down there, up there. Some people say that where we live in Illinois is south of Alabama. 
<laughs> when my wife and I moved into the community, they used to ask us a lot, are you visiting? No, but now they, we, we have friends all over the community. We have, you know, they call me Reverend. They, we see them in Walmart. Reverend, I've been watching you. I've been listening to you. I'm not Pentecostal now, but I've been listening to y'all folk. And I believe what you say, but I'm not necessarily a member of your church. So we had a gentleman that walked into our church a couple of weeks ago, a Caucasian young man. He, he told me his age. He's 52 years old. And he walked in on the day that there was a COVID spike in Illinois. And we got this immediate bulletin, close the churches. There's a big COVID spike. So we had about five people at church that day, and he didn't get the notice because he doesn't have our internet connection. And he walked in, he said, where is everybody? Can I stay? I said, you can stay, I'm still preaching. And he stayed, and he said, let me tell you why I came here. He said, I have lunch with pastors of different denominations each week, usually on Sunday afternoon. And he said, they get together and they spend most of their time talking politics. And he said, not too long ago, I had to say to them, brethren, I'm looking for Jesus. I will no longer be having lunch with you guys. And he said, that's why I'm here. Because I've been listening to 3ABN radio. I've been watching 3ABN television. And he says, you're preaching the gospel from the word of God about Christ. And you are not pushing politics from your podium. Can we say amen? So that's why the Lord is saying here, when we claim to believe present truth, it is as responsible for us as it is for your pastor. Because there may be those that have a strong stand, but if they see the pastor wavering or giving them permission to go in a different direction, they'll go in that direction because they tend to lean there and the only thing holding them is their conscience. But if the pastor, by his example, begins to violate their conscience and make them feel that liberty to go that way, they might say, well, you know, I'm just doing what the pastor's doing. Pastor, stand firm. Amen? Amen. That's what she meant by that. Many Christian leaders have traded the gospel for the wrong message, and Satan has already had them. Listen to Councils on Stewardship, page 154, paragraph 1. Some of you have heard this before, but I'm going to read it slowly. As the people of God approach the perils of the last days, Satan holds earnest consultation with his angels. Now that alone should cause you to be way wide awake. He, he holds earnest consultation with his angels. Listen to why. As to the most successful plan of overthrowing their faith. Now put that in your mind. The devil says to his angels, what do you have today about the... What can we do to overthrow the faith of those Seventh-day Adventists? And it says, he holds consultation with his angels as to the most successful plan of overthrowing their faith. And here's why. He focuses on the remnant. He sees that the popular churches are already lulled to sleep by his deceptive power. By pleasing sophistry and lying wonders, he can continue to hold them under his control. Therefore, he directs his angels to lay their snares, especially for those who are looking for the second advent of Christ and endeavoring to keep all the commandments of God. As Elder Brooks once said, it's not how high you jump, it's how straight you walk when you hit the ground. And we have become a people, and I'm going to be very candid today, you know, um, I'm going to tell you like it is, and I'll have the pastor watch my back when I walk out. <laughs> it's okay, okay. <laughs> Is that your wife's name too? Okay, okay. But um, let's talk about the popular churches. There was a time, there was a time when there was a clear, distinct difference between a Seventh-day Adventist Christian and people of other churches. Now let me begin with the common things. Let us never conclude that because a person is a member of another church that they don't love Jesus. That's the first mistake we could make. Because Jesus himself said, don't ever go there. Other sheep I have that are not of this fold. But he didn't stop. Them also I must bring. And they will hear my voice. And there will be one fold and one shepherd. But let me make a point. There's going to be one fold. One fold. But let me make a point. 
he's not going to bring folk from that fold to this if bringing them over is going to make them more of a devil than when they were there. That's why the Lord never rebuked people, but he always rebuked the Pharisees because the Pharisees put so many burdens before the people that the Lord said to them, by the time they become like you, they are seven times more evil than before they met you. Why am I saying that? Why am I saying that? When somebody, if somebody walks through the doors of this present truth congregation and they don't look like you want them to look, that's not your problem. That's not your problem. The Lord said, he made you fishers of men. He never made us cleaners of fish. He never told me to clean fish. He said, catch him. Pastor, catch him. So as a pastor, here's what I've established in my congregation and throughout my ministry. And I'm going to qualify this because some of you conservative people might get a little broken up. But listen carefully. The Lord Jesus came in his determination to save fallen humanity. But the Pharisees had so many things that they put before the people before they could feel comfortable with them that the Lord one day had enough of it and he said, the harlot, the publican, and the tax collector will make the kingdom before you. Now why do you say that? Because, they, 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 because the Pharisees preserved themselves for the best seats and they looked religious. But he said internally they were whited sepulchers. Why am I saying that? Because if the message hasn't changed you, your standards are not the method by which people are going to enter the kingdom. I'll say that again. The standards by which we are judged are established by the word of God. Never allow your standards to be the standards by which somebody eventually feels comfortable coming to church. And this is, what I, this is why as a pastor I've learned this. Because I've had police in my churches. There's some, there's some Adventist police. <laughs> Lord revealed something to me even this morning as I was getting ready. You know, we say we keep the commandments of God. We say we don't, we don't keep the ceremonial law bef anymore, right? No, Adventists have some ceremonial laws. You, you vegan? Now, understand me now. That's a healthy lifestyle. But that is not salvation. Understand the difference between a healthy life. The Lord wants us to be fit ready for the mission but don't ever get that mixed up with salvation the Pharisees were so determined to put on a good display they washed their arms all the way up to their shoulder but the Lord said you look clean but you are a nothing but a whited sepulcher and as we get ready for the coming of the Lord this is why it has to be very clear today when we preserve allegiance to the government of God it should make a difference in how we treat other people because the popular churches, and this is what is amazing to me about the, you know, we call them the popular churches. We sometimes call them, well, you know, they lost because they, they don't keep the Sabbath. We are easy to say that, you know, they don't keep the Sabbath. But I want you to know there are nine other commandments, brethren. There are no one commandment. There are nine more. How many more? So don't be boasting about the Sabbath if the other nine are not just as important. Nine of them. I've been to churches, different churches, different congregations, just on my way coming down here. When, when before COVID hit, I was doing a series of meetings for the community where we live. And I only had three sermons that I could preach. It was in the city hall for the community. I decided, Lord, what do you want me to preach and I decided I'm going to preach the everlasting gospel. My first sermon was signs of the second coming of Christ. The second one was America in prophecy. And the third one was the fall of Babylon. That's for the community. That's deep. That's concentrated. Solid slide program. 
Well, there was a gentleman that came in. We invited the musicians to be. If you've watched 3ABN before, you've heard of Lanny Wolf. Yes. Well, we invited Lanny Wolf. You've got to be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. Lanny Wolf understood, and Lanny Wolf has been studying the Advent message because as he's rubbed shoulders with us, he said, I had never heard this message before. Even another man by the name of Dave Hunzinger, a Methodist who had been the one that wrote many of the songs on the first project that 3ABN did, like, um, Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. That was written by a Methodist. When, we, when Pastor C.A. and I sat down and talked with him, he, his eyes were open to a message he had never heard about the judgment and what happens when you die and what's taking place in heaven. We have a high priest. He's in the sanctuary. That was written by a Methodist. But you know what he said to me? And I'll go back to my story. He said, when I study this message, it transformed my life. He said, but I went to Adventist churches. And I walked in expecting to see some folk excited about the message. And he said, frankly, Danny, I was disappointed. Because what I just learned, I was expecting to see something different. So he has not yet made his decision, but one plants, another waters. But God gives the increase. So as I did these meetings in Southern Illinois in 2019, a gentleman walked in that came to see Lanny Wolf, and he was one of the popular churches. I'll tell you what else he said when COVID hit. But he didn't come to see me. He didn't know me from Adam. He came to listen to Lanny Wolf in their group that's very well known in the Christian world. Songs like More Than Wonderful, Lanny Wolf wrote that, and more than 700 others. So Lanny Wolf was there performing with his group, and this gentleman sat in the front row with a nice suit, sharp. He was a pastor. He wasn't paying attention to me. His wife was sitting next to him. But the Lord said, preach. And I had a huge wall, about a 30-inch screen. Slides were right in front of him. Well, he sat up and listened a little bit. He came the next night, and he sat up even straighter and listened. And when he went to the foyer, he said, something happened tonight. I have never heard that. When people came in each night, we would give them all a packet, including the three angels' messages, the great controversy, desire of ages, steps to Christ. You know how we like to do he said, no, I don't want any of that. But when that meeting ended that night, he took seven great controversies. <laughs> he took a whole packet of materials, stack of Bible lessons. And I was a little discouraged because the post office, you see, when you send out announcements, the devil works through the post offices. You know, your stuff gets lost. You know, delivered two weeks after the meetings are done. So I said, okay. So I was a little discouraged, and he picked up on that, and his wife picked up on that, and she said, Pastor Loma King, I know you're a little discouraged by the, out, by the turnout, but let me tell you something. The Lord knew who needed to be here, and we were here. She said, my husband leads out on a coalition of pastors in southern Illinois. God knew who needed to be here, and she's with a hand full of stuff now. <laughs> and um, and then, then he invited me to come to something that was being held on a Friday night with all these evangelical pastors, something for the community. I went, I sang. They said, you can sell your CDs. I said, no, it's the Sabbath. And he understood that. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. But I sang. And, and when he invited my wife and I backstage to meet all these other pastors from all these different denominations, I just met him a little more than two weeks earlier. He said, this is my good friend, Pastor Loma Kay. <laughs> He's a Pentecostal minister. And he said, the Lord put him in my life for a reason. And I want to introduce him to you all too. And I received their business cards and material. And they said, we got to get together and talk. And he has invited me from one event to the other. When the whole issue of, 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 of Black Lives Matter hit the media, these Sunday pastors in southern Illinois and in Indiana different denominations, different races, they got together. Oh, if only Adventist pastors would have done the same. They got together. They said, we are going to root out racism in our congregations. White pastors and black pastors and Asian pastors got together at the ballroom of this hotel and saying, brethren, one white pastor stood up and said, brethren, 
I must stand up here and say my grandfather was a slave owner. My family contributed to the problem of slavery. But today I repent, I repent for what I did to my black brothers. And he called the black pastors up and said, Brother, forgive me for what my family did to you. Another, another pastor, white pastor, laid on his face on the ground. He said, Lord, have mercy. Forgive us for what we have done to other people of a different skin color than us. Would to God that Adventist pastors got together and did that. But we became so enamored by the wrong man that when he said jump, so many of us decided to follow one man rather than follow the man. That's why I say God has his people in other churches. But the second meeting that he attended, what I didn't know, Pastor, was as I'm preaching on the, the um, America in Prophecy, he has his phone. He called the state senator in the state of Illinois. And he had him listen to my whole sermon. And at the end of that, the state senator said, I want to meet him. So that Friday night, I met with the state senator. He is the senator of the largest district in the state of Illinois, uh, Senator Dale Fowler. And um, I gave him an entire packet. Music, the message, three angels' messages, all that wrapped it neatly and presented it to him. We are friends to this day. We would, we would meet every Wednesday at 10 o'clock in the morning to have Bible studies together on Zoom during COVID. And a senator would say to me, Pastor, what's the word of God from you today for me? He's Republican. The other pastor's Republican. But he said again, he said, I have three friends. You, the senator, and just one other guy. And I just met the man. On my way down here yesterday, I got a text from him. He said, the senator wants to talk to you today because he's been so busy, we've ha we have not been able to get together. And as I was driving through Tennessee, the senator and this pastor and I are on the phone talking together, Amen. sharing with me what's happening politically. But he said, he said, Pastor, what's on your heart from the Lord today for me? And he said, when we get back, let's get together and sit down. And this Baptist, this Baptist pastor said to me, uh, he said, my wife has a picture of him. This Baptist passes, and I'll show you his picture this afternoon. He said to me, the Lord brought you in my life for a reason, and I'm going to stick around long enough to find out why. Amen. Let me tell you another reason why COVID hit. Because I suggested to him in 2019, because we've had Bible studies on some tough Adventist topics, Mark of the Beast, the Sunday Law. Because he one day said to me, he said, what is it about you that's different? What is it about you that's different? He said, I've been around a lot of pastors, but you don't talk like them. What is it about different? I said, because I want to make the devil angry. He said, what do you mean by that? I said, if what you do doesn't make the devil angry, then you are no threat to his kingdom. And I, and I share with him Revelation 12 and verse 17, the remnant. He said, explain that to me. And after we walked through that, he said, I got it now. I, I see it now. I understand it now. So he has been, by God's leading, at the foot of God's word. Amen. So brethren, when we go, let us understand that we have too much light to give up the light of God's truth for emotionalism. Because the music... See, if you... Can I apologize to those of you that may not be African American? African Americans got rhythm. It's just, it was born that way. We just like, you know, it's spreading out to other races. But we are naturally emotional, right? We are naturally expressive. But sometimes we could go so far that we can't tell whether we're in the club or in church. But if how you moving is taking you back to where you came from, then you are not on your way to the kingdom. So let's not do like the people did with Aaron. Let us not make ourselves a god and start going back to Egypt. Because right now, you know, Donnie, we sing Donnie McClurkin songs and C.C. Wine, Wine and songs. Don't allow, and the devil's smart. Remember, he is, he was a master musician. You don't think he's going to use music to try to break down the message? But don't ever forget, when Jesus was in the Garden of Eden, when Jesus was in the Garden of Temptation, Jesus never said, it is sung. He said, it is written. Amen? 
Let's not allow the world to break us down. Point number three. Let us not allow the world to break us down. I'm trying to be relevant. Point number three. The remnant will not abandon the truth. The remnant will not abandon the truth. Psalm 145 and verse 18. The Bible says, The Lord is near to all who call upon him. To all who call upon him in truth. Do you know the word truth has become a bad word even in Christian circles? Because just like, just like Pilate, what is truth? So somebody said to me once, that's your truth and this is my truth. Let me tell you something, brother. I said to a pastor who argued with me about preaching on the Sabbath. I was doing a series of meetings once and a pastor wrote me a letter about me preaching on the Sabbath because one of his members wanted to find out more about the Sabbath. A lady that held the purse strings for building a new church. And they pressured that older woman because she was the one who held the money to build their new church. She heard about the Sabbath and wanted to begin to follow it. But the pastor and her son pressured her. And they got so upset with me, they wrote me a letter and said to me, for the sake of our ch your church, for the sake of your church in our community, please re reconsider your position. Now, I'm from Brooklyn. That sounds like a threat. <laughs> For the sake of my church. So I met with him. I said, Pastor Johnson, what did you mean by that? And he explained to me that, you know, he, th he, he said, I'm going too far on the Sabbath. You're going, you put too, you're going too far on the Sabbath thing. You mess it. My members are getting upset about it. I said, let's do this. Invite me to your church. At that time, he had the biggest church in town in a movie theater when we lived up in the mountains of California. I said, you invite me to your church. I'll sit on your rostrum or your stage. Let your congregation ask me questions and they ask you questions. We both answer from the Bible and let them determine who's telling the truth. He said, no, no, no. <laughs> and I said it respectfully, but I said it firmly. I said, then please don't write me any more letters about that because I'm going to keep preaching about the truth. Brethren, the remnant do not abandon truth for favoritism. Don't allow relationships with anything or anybody, whether they are wealthy or poor, to erode your allegiance to the undiluted truth of God's word. That's one thing I like about 3ABN. We don't care what you like or what you don't like. We are going to preach the undiluted three angels' messages one that will counteract the counterfeit. And even people that come there and sing along with us that are not Adventists, we don't bring them there just to sing, but to rub shoulders with them to plant these seeds. And let God take those seeds. But if we never plant those seeds, God could never do anything with it. Do not abandon the truth. That's why when Jezebel and Ahab got angry towards Elijah, do you know that the devil that stirred up Ahab and Jezebel against Elijah is stirring up the world against Seventh-day Adventists? 1 Kings 18 and verse 7, notice what they said about Elijah. Oh, yes. And you know, the devil's been attacking me my whole life. But he's really upped the ante since I came, became a minister. Look at 1 Kings 18 and verse 7. When, uh, when Elijah stood before Ahab, look what Ahab said. <laughs> the Bible says, Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, is that you, O troubler of Israel? I'd rather be called a troubler than a compromiser. Amen? Because the world wants us to blend in. But what I've learned as I get older, what I've learned is there are people in every walk of life. There are people in every denomination that are looking for something different. Let me tell you what I mean by that. My good friend I talked about, his, his name is Philip. He said, call me Philip. I said, okay, call me John. But he always calls me pastor. So I said, so I go back to pastor. I said, he said, since COVID hit, he said, pastor, to be honest with you, our churches don't know what to do because we cannot, we can't sustain ourselves without the religious hype. The music. He said, it ain't going to work on Zoom. So I said, which many of us don't understand, the Lord allowed, what word did I just say? The Lord allowed COVID to start sifting us. Because when, if and when this thing finally lifts, you know what's going to happen? 
those who, those, who, those who survive the sifting will come back to church. But I've already had people tell me, I don't need to go back to church. But this pastor said, we can't survive in our churches without the emotional hype. He said, how is it in your church? I said, well, I'll tell you how it is in my church. In 2020, we never missed a budget. In 2020, the Lord blessed us with more money than any other year we've ever been in ministry. He said, what? I said, in 2020, God increased our presence around the world and in our community because of preaching a straight, solid, scriptural message. But it's not happening. So what God is doing is God is allowing all this false stuff to be shut down. Is it, is it coincidental that there are no Christian concerts? Because the Lord is trying to get them back to the Word. Yeah, down in Nashville, I know people in the industry, they said they're losing money by the millions. Gentleman had, he owned a hundred buses. He would rent these buses out and lease them out to politicians and famous musicians. He said he had to get rid of 90 of his buses because he can't afford it. Musicians are being laid off. People in singing groups are being told by their producers and their managers, you're free, you, you can go find a job someplace else because they can't afford it. And these are people that make their money in music. When you can't sing, God says now it's time to turn back to the word. So people of God, do not abandon truth in these times where things are changing. Amen, somebody? Amen. But not only do we remain uh, loyal to truth, we do not abandon doctrinal integrity. Point number four. I just have two more points. Hold on. Can you hold on? We do not abandon doctrinal integrity because controversies are arising in areas of doctrine. Let me make a very important point here. It's important to understand the 2300 days, is it not? But you know what's more, more important than that? If you understand the 2300 days, but you don't know Jesus, so why does God give us doctrinal integrity? To be the fence to protect us from deception. So you need to know the truth. By no means will I downplay the importance of doctrinal integrity. The sanctuary, we ought to understand that. We ought to, we ought to shield ourselves from this new generation theology. Don't get pulled in by date setting. And there are those that are even reinterpreting the 1260 days of Daniel. Some people are saying that the Pope is now the application in the modern times. Be careful. God established doctrinal prophetic understandings through people that were praying. All of a sudden, these young people looking for something new and fanciful come along and they reinterpret things. And I'm seeing, I'm seeing Adventist pastors leave the ministry because they refuse to abandon false doctrines. And people follow them. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 295. Listen to what the servant of the Lord says. Men and women will arise professing to have some new light or some new revelation whose tendency is to unsettle faith in the old landmarks. What kind of landmarks? Jeremiah said, ask for the old paths wherein righteousness dwells. You know, when you're in the forest and you're trying to find your way, it's so good to see that somebody walked ahead of you so you could find your way out of the forest. <laughs> you start digging your own grooves, you'll get lost. She says, their, doctrine, their doctrines will not bear the test of God's word, yet souls will be deceived. False reports will be circulated, and some will be taken in its snare. They will believe rumors, and in turn will repeat them. And thus a link will be formed connecting them to the arch deceiver. There are people that, I mean, Adventists. My wife got off of Facebook because she got tired of Aryan Adventists. There was, Adventist, there was this Adventist pastor and his wife that just could not stop posting stuff just to get angry at me. I told them when they first embraced this false teaching of Revelation, the 1260 days of three and a half years, I said, brother, that's not scriptural, that's not true. So they would, she would intentionally post things on Facebook just to try to 
She'd call me out on Facebook just to make me look bad. And I said, if you don't abandon that stuff, you're going to lose your salvation. This is not scriptural. Well, what happened? They, they set dates. They did date setting. And the date passed. And this pastor had to post an apology on Facebook. But he already got kicked out of the ministry. And I got calls from people that said, we believed him. We followed him. Adventist pastor. Brethren, if you don't find the scriptures to be the place where the truth of God is formulated, do not allow the intellect of somebody who thinks that they know better to replace the truth of God's word already firmly established. Amen, Amen brethren? That's why Ephesians 4 and verse 13. Till we come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of what? Of Christ. The remnant will preserve doctrinal integrity. Point number five. Point number five. And this is a smorgasbord this morning. Because you don't want to miss this afternoon. Point number five. The remnant will have the same mission as Jesus. The same mission. What is the mission? Let's go to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 to 3. Look at the mission of Jesus. The mission of Jesus. I've been learning a lot lately. I have been praying, and my wife and I have been praying. And do you know what happens when you pray and study God's Word? Something amazing happens. You start seeing old Bible verses with new eyes. Verses that you overlooked for years, all of a sudden it starts to become clear. But unless you study and read God's Word, you will never know that. Look at Isaiah 61. What is, the, what is the mission of Jesus? Here it is. Are you ready? Here it is. Isaiah 61 and verse 1 to 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. I'll ask you right now, is he upon you? If he is, this is what will happen in your life. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. When you meet people that are poor in spirit, do not beat them down Leave them with hope that there is some way that they can still be saved. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, not to break the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. To console those who mourn in Zion. To give them beauty for what? Ashes. The oil of joy for what? Morning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And here's why. That they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. What is all that saying? Wow. And I have one more point. What's all that saying? Remind me to share a quotation with you this afternoon. My wife will remind me that the Lord revealed to me just recently. Servant of the Lord said, some people hear the phrase, you must be born again. But because they're so novice in God's word, they don't understand what that means. And they go through life sad for many, many years because we say to them, I'm going to give you the paraphrase and I'll show you the quote later, because they say to them, give me evidence that you're changed and then you could be baptized. Now watch this, this is deep. And because they see no evidence of their change, she said they live years in sadness. Only hoping that somehow God will accept them. And Ellen White says that the moment they became weary with sin and turned and determined to seek God, at that moment he accepted them. Let me make that real to you today. You see, the Lord is behind us, pursuing us on the road to destruction, and he's saying to us, turn, turn, why should you die? And he sees us signaling to get off the exit ramp. And he said, they heard me. They heard me. And as soon as we signal to get off the exit ramp because our lives have been going in the wrong direction, the moment we signal to turn around, the Lord says, yes! I'll be waiting for you on the other side. 
You see, brethren, if we told people that are weary with sin, people that have been struggling with alcohol and cigarettes and pornography, people struggling with broken lives and broken marriages, people struggling that they feel that nobody is as bad as they are, if we said to them, God will accept you as broken as you are and will fix you up, if we say the only standard for Christ to accept you is just simply to turn to him, she says, what they did not know is in the moment that they turned to Jesus, he accepted them. Watch this. Before there was any evidence of a change. Lord, have mercy when we go to Pollock and say to people, is there butter in that? Don't get me started. Is there cheese in that? Is it real cheese or vegan cheese? These are, these are Adventist, these are Adventist cer ceremonies. Oh, but I'm going to tell you today, brethren, I'm going to tell you today, we could be doctrinally sound but spiritually corrupt. If it has not affected a change in our character, we are putting stumbling blocks before people that want to find Jesus. You saw what happened to the woman that tried to get healed from all these years of bleeding. The crowd was in her way. Sometimes we're in the crowd and we're in the way of somebody trying to get to Jesus. Present truth is our understanding, but the presence of Jesus in our life is our evidence. And so we, we preach clean colons but settle for corrupt hearts. And you've got to remember, brethren... I'm telling you, like, we got to remember, you got to remember, it's not always what's going into your mouth, but sometimes it's what's coming out. And some of us are focusing on what people are eating, and we ignore what's eating us. We want people to be cleaner than us, to be saved. And we don't want to look at our own selves. God has brought my wife and I to a new place. So my heart is more moved to people that know what it's like to be broken. You ever been broken before? You ever done something that you feel that not even God wants to talk to you about? Listen to what he says. Remember, Ellen White says, the moment they became weary with sin, God accepted them. That's why Jesus says, come unto me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There are folks that have been dragging burdens that they cannot do anything with. They smell like the world. They look like the world. They dress like the world. Oh, Lord, help me. They dress like the world. But I want to tell you, brethren, even as we approach dress reform, if our hearts are not transformed first... Ellen Weiss says in the book, Historical Sketches, page 123. Not a very often quoted book, but listen to what she says. Historical Sketches, page 123. Listen to what she says. We must present the principles of truth and let them work upon the hearts of the people. Listen. We may pick the leaves from a tree as often as we please, but this will not change the tree. This will not cause the tree to die. The next season, the, the leaves will come out again as thick as before. But strike the axe at the root of the tree. And not only will the leaves fall off of them, but the tree will die. Those who accept the truth in the love of it will die to the world and will become meek and lowly in heart like the divine Lord. Just as soon as the heart is right, the dress the conversation, the life will be in harmony with God's word. When the heart is right, the dress will change. Lord, have mercy that we raise standards for people to find Jesus. That's why young ladies sometimes and young men say, I can't go to that church because their standards are higher than Jesus' standards. Brethren, when we realize at the foot of the cross there are no varying altitudes, we're all on the same level. And when you realize, I, I think that it's, when your carcass walks through the gates into the new Jerusalem, only then you'll realize the grace of God. I just want to get in. I don't need a mansion. I just need me a sleeping bag. 
Amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. I don't need a mansion. Just give me a sleeping bag. Matter of fact, I don't even need a sleeping bag. I'll sleep outside on the golden streets. I just, I just want to get in. And I want my sister to get in. And I want my family to get in. And maybe the reason why your children ain't in yet because they don't see the Jesus in you that they need to see. Because you tell them how bad they are rather than showing them how good Jesus is to you. If they see the invitation of Christ breaking their hearts, you can't break your children by telling them that everything is wrong. you got to show them what's right. I think I have one point left. It's somewhere in here. And here it is. Here it is. So, brethren, what am I saying? If the Lord's Spirit has laid an axe at the root of your tree. A good tree, this is the principles, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. But a ba don't look for good fruit on a bad tree. We say to folk, look, how, look at you, you 40 years old and still acting like the same way. That's unjust. Because no matter how old you are, until you are changed, you're going to be that way. The Lord don't change folk because they get older. He changed them because Jesus comes on the inside. We say to our sons that are 55 years old, look at you, all your life you were raised in Adventist church. You're just as much a fool now as you was then. I'm saying it in a sanctified way. And, that's why he, and then he'll say, that's why I don't go to your church because of the way you talk to me. But if you say to him, I'm praying for you, son, because I, I want you to make the kingdom. I'm praying for you because I don't want to be in heaven without you. I tell my sister, my sister left the church at 16 years old. When I get a chance to talk to her and pray for her, I said, what am I going to say when I make it to the kingdom and mama is there? And she asked me, what happened to your sister? I said to her, what am I going to say? And she says to me, brother, don't worry about it. I'm going to be there. You gotta, your heart has to break for your loved ones for them to understand that you want them to be in the kingdom. Shut your mouth. Let your heart break. When they see that you want them there, they'll see something in you that will attract them to the Christ who breaks his hearts for those who will be lost. Jesus said, I'm not willing that any should perish. But sometimes we are. I spoke to a young man just the other day in my office a few days ago. Years ago, shacked up with a young lady, got her pregnant. Refused to get a marriage certificate. Had a marriage. It didn't work. It fell apart. He ran after another young lady. That fell apart. I saw him in the gas station after many years, more than 12 years. And he said to me, when, he, when I saw you, Caucasian young man, he said, when I saw you, the Lord said to me, you need to talk to Pastor Loma Kang. He said, that's why I'm here. He said, Pastor, my life is messed up. I said, how old are you? He said, I'm 41. I said, remember, he's, I said, you remember the last time we met? You left a, a lot of cursing on my phone. You cursed me out. He said, I remember that. I was, I was, I'm sorry. He said, but you were proud too. I said, no, I was standing on what's right. He said, but you had a lot of passion to us. Yes, because I was trying to get your attention. So he said, do you think, um, he said, the Lord told me I need to get my life right. I said, what happened to your wife? We divorced. I ran after another woman. That fell apart. He said, what do you think the board is going to say if I say I want to be baptized? I said, it ain't the board's business. The board. I said, you got a friend in me because I got a friend in Jesus. And he says, whomsoever, whomsoever will, let him come. So you see, that young man sat up. He was slouching. He sat up and straightened his cap, and his eyes lit up. I said, brethren, the apostle Paul said there's a whole lot of junk behind me, and I'm going to forget it, and I'm going to press toward the mark for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So while you may have thought I came to talk about all oh, our doctrinal integrity, which praise God for that. Come on, somebody, say amen. amen. I came today to remind you, don't, of our, our, don't allow the beauty of Christ to be lost 
in a church claiming to have truth. If the truth is present and Jesus is absent, we're going to hell. The remnant are committed to Christ first and foremost. That's why the devil is angry. Not because they keep the commandments of God alone, but keeping the commandments of God have transformed their lives by the power of the indwelling Christ. And that's why the servant of the Lord says the Lord is waiting for his character to be reproduced in his people. And just as soon as the character of God is reproduced in us, Jesus is going to come. Some of them ask my brother Abraham. I'm going to sing a song as I close entitled, I Give You Jesus. You see, friends, I give you Jesus. I'm going I'm to end with that song. Listen to this. We have a lot more this afternoon, but I've got I to shut it down here. Who are the remnant? We are a people that first and foremost know who Jesus is. If you don't know who Jesus is, you're wasting your time. Hold on. Don't start it yet. I got you. Just hit the space bar and just pause it there for me. I appreciate it. If you don't know who Jesus is, being an Adventist will never save you. But if you are a Seventh-day Adventist, then please, for the sake of the kingdom of God, get to know who Jesus is. Because Jesus said it clearly. Watch, here's my closing line. He did not say, if the mark of the beast be lifted up. He didn't say, if health reform be lifted up. He didn't say, if diet and dress be lifted up. He didn't say, if our institutions and our churches be lifted up. He says, if I be lifted up. What is, what is the three angels' messages in verity? The righteousness of Jesus. Understand that. This book that I told you about spends most of its time on that. But it doesn't cut any corners on the three angels' messages. And I end that booklet by saying this, and let me just tell you what it ends by saying. Listen to this last quote. This is the last part of it. Here it is on the last page. This is what I say. He says, Those that respond to God's final call and the message of the three angels will share in the eternal blessings of being included in the harvest of the redeemed. When sin is eternally removed and the kingdoms of rebellion have run their course, the saved of all the ages will share in the undimmed glory of the Father and the triumph of His Son, Christ Jesus. My prayer is that you will respond to the invitation of heaven. There is no better time than now to reserve your place in the eternal kingdom of God. The three angels' messages stand in harmony with one of the most loved Bible verses of all time. When you make your decision to stand in harmony with heaven, you will appreciate the words of the disciple who said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm going to close with this song. And as I sing this song, if your prayer today is to get a clearer picture of Christ, the, the truth is clear. But I want you to get a clearer picture of Christ. When you see Jesus for who he is, you'll see you for who you are. How do I know? The wages of sin is death. That's what I deserve. But Jesus said, uh-uh, I got a gift for you. When the Lord can look at me and say, I got a gift for you, the gift of eternal life, that's the Jesus I want to present to every broken person I come in contact with. As I sing the song, I pray that if it's your desire to get a clearer picture of Christ and present the present truth, but Jesus before it, Jesus in the middle of it, and Jesus at the end of it, there will be souls for the kingdom that will say, I want to see Jesus. <laughs> Here's the key. The Lord does not want to reveal the truth to us. He wants to reveal the truth through us. Go ahead, my brother Abraham. And I'll Loving Father in heaven, the world needs the evidence that Jesus still lives. Not living in cathedrals and in churches and in books, but that he lives in the hearts of his people, hearts whose lives are being transformed. Precious Savior, we pray that you would have done such a job in us, that someone coming in contact with us would come in contact with Jesus. 
that their hopes will be renewed, that their failures would be forgotten, and that they will find that no matter how far they have fallen, you still save to the uttermost those who come to God, seeing that you ever live to make intercession for every one of us. Father, thank you for the present truth. Thank you for this remnant message, and we praise you today that this truth has truly protected us from deception and darkness and going in the wrong direction, but we pray that our light and the presence of Christ in us will shine so brightly that that person looking for evidence of a change and hope and a future will find it in those whose lives have been transformed. So change us, Father, we pray. Transform us, renew us, invigorate us, and may we then, qualified by the unction of your Spirit, go to the highways and hedges, and when we compel men to come, they will see what Christ has done for us, and they will desire for him to do the same for them. And then your banquet will be furnished with guests, ready to meet you in peace. Change us, we pray, for your glory and your glory alone. In Jesus' name I pray, and all of God's people said, Amen, amen and amen.